Uh, we now move to questions to the Minister of Health, so the Services and Public Safety, and we'll start with oral questions again. And I call Joe Byrne. Mr. Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number one. Thank the member for the question. Uh, the Southern Health and Social Care Trust have directly recruited for 2009-10 three junior doctors, 10-11 six junior doctors, 11-12 three junior doctors, 12-13 six junior doctors, and 13-14 two junior doctors. The Southern Trust has approximately 225 junior doctor posts, and them that have filled over 90% of these posts. Answer. Would the minister accept? But succession planning is going to be important in hospitals going forward for doctors. And therefore, is the Minister content that there is enough training in place for F1s, F2s, SHOs, and indeed registrars to meet the needs of retiring consultants going forward? Well, it certainly is an issue for us, Mr. Speaker, and, and, and it's something that we work with NIMDATA in identifying the numbers of doctors that we might need and, and uh, moving things forward. I think that we have issues in particular areas. And uh, ONG uh, and in emergency departments, for example, are, are two areas uh, where we uh, sometimes can struggle to fill positions. And them that are very well aware that that's the case, and they have a role in ensuring that there are adequate numbers of doctors to fill those positions. Uh, very often we have a greater problem when it comes to middle grade doctors than we have with junior doctors. And in all of this, and I raised this matter last week with Theresa Villers, that uh, we used to be able to bring uh, doctors into Northern Ireland, and indeed right across uh, the UK, uh, from many Commonwealth countries. Uh, but because of European regulations, uh, we are being restricted in doing that. And I, for one, uh, would be very prepared to challenge um, European regulations if it's going to impact upon people's health in a detrimental way. And I would be encouraging um, the Home Office and, and, and uh, Land and Border Security to, to, to look at these issues. Can, me but, um, can I ask the Minister that given the fact that the cost of locums in the Western Trust was £5 million uh, this year for the appointment of junior doctors, uh, because junior doctors are not often applying because of the regional disparities and deficits issues in the Western Trust area, how can the Minister address that particular issue? Well, I'm not in a position to force people to work in particular areas. Uh, jobs are advertised and recruitment is carried out, and people apply for jobs. And uh, I recognise that it is more difficult uh, to fill jobs in uh, the areas away from uh, Belfast, and it's more challenging and more difficult, and that's something that we have to deal with. I think the Western Trust work very, very hard on recruitment, uh, but they do find challenges in particular areas and particular specialities, and we need to recognise that. We will support them uh, in what they're attempting to do, uh, and I think that, uh, in spite of everything, we're getting good results in the Western Trust area uh, on many fronts, and they are to be congratulated for that. Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for his answers thus far. Can I ask the Minister what efforts are being made to recruit doctors um, for the emergency departments at Down and Lagan Valley Hospitals? Well, in response to my request, the Trust has redoubled its efforts to attract emergency medical staff to both the Lagan Valley and Down hospitals. Advertisements have been placed in local press, in addition to further contact being made with the various recruitment agencies. The South Eastern Trust has been endeavouring uh, to recruit middle grade doctors to all of its hospitals. However, it has not been possible for all of the vacancies, primarily due to a regional and national shortage of these staff. In addition, local hospitals also have difficulties in attracting staff of this type for reasons such as geographical re uh, location, perception of standalone facility, and the increasingly stringent clinical standards whereby medical staff have to demonstrate competencies linked to volume and case mix which cannot be maintained in smaller hospitals. During the financial year 13-14, the Trust to date has incurred expenditure of uh, around £4,000 on two recruitment campaigns, and the costs do not include the use of local medical staff. Um, in July 2013, Speciality Doctor Post was advertised. On the 16th of June 2013, nine vacancies and three three, there were three applicants, and two appointments were made. On the 7th of January, Advertisements were placed in the media for a consultant 
and speciality doctor posts, and outside the normal recruitment processes, the Trust has also tried to develop its own middle grade staff, often by working intensively with locum staff to develop their skills to a point where they are able to work at middle grade level and become Trust employees. The Trust has also opportunistically brought in GP trainees who have expressed an interest in emergency medicine and helped them to reach the point where they were able to cover middle grade roles. It is also found that traditional advertising has been largely unsuccessful in filling middle grade posts and recruitment of staff across emergency departments is a UK-wide theme and is currently estimated that up to 50 per cent of all emergency department posts are unfilled. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Roy Banks. Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> the uh, junior doctors go through a training programme and ultimately so do middle grade doctors. Can the Minister assure us that there is a sufficient training budget for doctors and indeed nurses so that in the future we will not continually face vacancies? Well, um, I, I, would, I don't want to uh, make myself uh, sound sexist here in any way, shape or form. Uh, we do have a higher number of females training as doctors, and I think it's a higher number of doctor trainees are actually um, young women as opposed to men at this point. We have many more who choose to opt out um, in their 30s uh, than would have been the case because uh, of demands of life and so forth and raising family and, and that's a choice that many of them make. So for example in, in GPs the average age I think for um, males retiring is 57, the average age for females retiring is 37. So one can see that where, where problems can arise because there has been a fundamental shift in the numbers of females now training to be doctors but many of them don't want to be working either full time and some of them actually um, opt out of the system at a relatively young age and that causes us um, greater problems. So there's more people being trained now than ever uh, but the actual retention of people as doctors uh, is very important. I think perhaps there may be opportunities to look at how we attract people back into uh, practice. So if someone does drop out because they want to be with their children at that early stage in life, what is the potential to actually get them back uh, into even part-time employment? at a later, later point, and perhaps some of the hurdles um, that, are, that are put there are too high to cross, and we need to look at how we can uh, be more flexible in bringing people back into employment within the healthcare system. Pat Ramsey. Mr. Ramsey. Question to Mr. Speaker. I am advised by the Western Health and Social Care Trust that it has plans in place for capital development of an additional theatre space by 2015. Part of this will be used by the Trauma and Orthopaedic Service to develop the elective inpatient and day case capacity within the Trust, so reducing reliance on the independent sector, the Trust will bid for recurrent revenue and capital equipment investment for this service development in the coming months. The Trust is also working with local commissioners on several developments for this service, including bone health and pre-operative assessment. Hey, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I declare an interest as a patient at the orthopaedics department at Alton Could I ask the minister, would he share my concern that we did have a centre of excellence for children's orthopaedics at Alton Galvin for the entirety of the Northwest, and we are losing that capacity now in the great fear and worry from parents who would be forced to take their children to Belfast? What can the minister's department do to assist in bringing that capacity back to the orthopaedic? Department. My understanding that again is about doctors, it's not about finance, and it isn't something that um, has been done to save money, it has been a, an inability to have the, the correct uh, and requisite number of, of people who were capable of actually providing the service. And uh, therefore we will provide what support um, the Western Trust you know, seek and, and require um, from the HSCB in terms of recruitment, in terms of support for the service, uh, to uh, help ensure that such a service can exist. Uh, but I understand that that, that has had uh, current difficulties, and that's why we're in the position that we're in. For order, just before I call uh, Mr. Dunn, and I say this in the mildest of terms, this is about a specific question on Alton Galvin, the Pacific Hospital, not prejudging uh, what the member's question might be, and a call, Gordon Dunn. <laughs> this is about the Alton Galvin Hospital. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
I thank the Minister for his answers today. Can the Minister give us an update on the new primary PCA unit at Alton Galvin Hospital? Yeah. Yeah. Which I understand will, will go a long way to treat heart attack patients in Londonderry. Yeah. Yeah. I thank uh, the member for, for what is a very topical question. Uh, the, the introduction of the service at Belfast, not the Galvin, will mean that patients having a heart attack will be taken directly to a cath lab that is capable of undertaking the procedure on a 24-7 basis. That is a substantial step forward in Northern Ireland uh, for those people who are victims of heart attack. It means that they will bypass emergency departments and other facilities to be taken directly to the cath labs, and I hope that members won't ask silly questions at some future point as to why the ambulance did bypass a certain hospital and was bypassing that hospital in the interest of the patient. It mightn't always get the right result because we are talking about life and death situations, but it will ensure that many more people survive heart attack as a result. The pilot took place at the Royal. The service became um, operational at 24-7 uh, on the 30th of September 2013. It is planned that the Alton Galvin service will provide a daytime uh, PCI service from spring, spring 2014 with a 24 7 service in place by the summer of 2014. Until this final phase of regional expansion is complete, services for patients who are not in the catchment of Belfast will continue with the use of clot busting drugs, followed by planned PCI before they discharge from hospital. I to the whole house, and I know where the member is coming from. But certainly, it was a different service. A different service. Or order, or order. It certainly was a different service to what the question is. But I allowed the question. So members shouldn't shouldn't take light of the rulings of the chair. Should not take light of the rulings of the chair. Thomas Buchanan, Mr. Question number three, Mr. Speaker. In 2012-13, significant investment was made to improve care for cystic fibrosis patients. This includes £4.4 million pounds identified recurrently to support the full introduction of the new drug treatment Iva Kaftor and a further 693000 to implement two National Institute for Health and Care Excellence approved treatments, mannitol dry powder, powder for inhalation and tobramycin dry powder for inhalation. There has also been investment in the children's service, including more staff for dietetics, physiotherapy, and pulmonary function services, and further improvement in the process of transition from paediatric to adult services. Thomas McCann. Mr. McCann. Yes, can I thank the Minister for his response? Can the Minister give the House any indication as to when the review of the cystic fibrosis service is due to take place? Uh, well, the, the cystic fibrosis uh, team in paediatrics currently doesn't meet the standards uh, that are set out by the standards of care document. Cystic Fibrosis Trust 2011, and there will be investment opportunities over the next few years to correct the small amount of staff that is required to meet these guidelines for paediatrics under the Vulnerable Specialities Workstream with HSCB, if this is deemed appropriate, following the publication of the next Cystic Fibrosis Review Report. So there is a willingness to ensure that, that, that we can uh, meet the needs of people with cystic fibrosis. Mr. Mr. Speaker, and, uh, can I thank the Minister? Uh, and can I ask him for his assessment of current methods of diagnosis for those with cystic fibrosis? Well, certainly, uh, cystic fibrosis is, is commonly identified at a very early point um, in paediatrics and very successfully identified, I'd have to say, in, in, in most instances. Um, I can recall very well as, as uh, a, a, a person who was leading a, a youth group in a church, um, having to deal with kids who had cystic fibrosis. In fact, we had three of them um, out of 440 in Northern Ireland and at the one time. And uh, all of those were identified uh, whenever they were, 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 were babies. And all of them at that time were told their life expectancy would be around 20 years. And unfortunately, in one case, that transpired to be the case, uh, but the other two are still alive. And indeed, uh, the average age for cystic fibrosis is now 41. So as a result of the fantastic work that was done, um, 
Through our research teams here in Northern Ireland, we have identified uh, a solution to the problem coming from the Celtic gene of cystic fibrosis, and as a consequence, those people can have a full life expectancy. That has been a huge investment of some four and a half million pounds, close to four and a half million pounds, for the acquisition of that drug. But those people will have full life expectancy. It's around 23 people. The investment is significant, and those are the big decisions that we have to make as to whether we fund a, a, a service such as this, but they make such an impact on people. But by funding this, uh, it will leave us short and so, somewhere else, and those are big decisions that we have to arrive at. Chris Little. Chris Little. Question number four. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will answer questions four and ten together, as they are both about the same subject. I am aware that being designated Ovarian Cancer Month by four leading ovarian <coughs> cancer charities, I would like to thank them for helping to highlight the signs and symptoms of this disease. I would also encourage any woman who has concerns about possible symptoms to go to their GP as soon as they can. The Public Health Agency is currently developing a cancer awareness campaign for Northern Ireland, which will prioritise ovarian cancer as an area within the campaign. And in taking this forward, the agency is evaluating current cancer awareness campaigns being conducted in England and Scotland <coughs> and conducting an evidence review to determine which specific tumour sites to include. This work is necessary to guide the development of the Northern Ireland campaign and will take several more months to finalise. Following this, the dates for the campaign will be announced and enacted as soon as possible. Thank the Minister for his response. Um, would he join me in paying tribute to women like Una Crudden, a tireless campaigner for ovarian cancer awareness, and as we are currently in Cervical Cancer Awareness Month, Sharon Montgomery of Cervical Cancer Northern Ireland? And would he not agree that targeted standalone campaigns are needed to raise awareness of symptoms, increase early diagnosis, and indeed to reduce the impact of this type of cancer on women in our community? Well, <clears throat> I think that we do certainly need to target specific areas, uh, and that is something uh, that will be done. Uh, I, I know that there are a number of, of organisations and groups which support people uh, with various types of cancer, and, and I know it was introduced uh, a number of years ago by uh, Mr. Anderson to Angels of Hope, um, because he had a special interest in that subject, and uh, I've had the opportunity of actually going to, into that facility. Um, I've met Una on a number of occasions. Uh, she's a fantastic lady. I've met Sharon on a number of occasions as well, and another uh, fantastic lady. And, and these people are raising awareness, and I greatly appreciate um, what they're doing. And we want to work with them and have their support <coughs> in what we're doing to highlight um, to the public how best they can identify um, the early signs of cancers and hopefully get treatment at an early point, which can uh, stop it progressing. Um, to, to uh, fatal consequence. Jim Wiles. Mr. Wiles. Uh, I'm sure the Minister will join me, along with Mr. Dittle, in congratulating Una Crudden for her outstanding work on ovarian cancer. But could he tell the members uh, what does the Eurocare 5 study reveal about cancer survival ship rates in Northern Ireland? Um, well, there's, the study is there's actually the fifth in a series analysed data from cancer registries which covered um, all or part of 29 countries, covering over 50 per cent of the adult and 77 per cent of the childhood population of Europe, including um, uh, anonymous data from 74,000 cancer patients in Northern Ireland. And it compares five-year survival uh, from diagnosis for more than 9 million adults and 60,000 uh, children diagnosed between 2000 and 2007. The main conclusion is that cancer survival has improved but still varies widely between European countries, despite major improvements in cancer diagnosis and treatment during the first decade of the 21st century. Nordic countries, with the exception of Denmark, Central European countries such as Austria, Belgium, France, Germany, Switzerland, and Netherlands, and some countries in Southern Europe, particularly Italy, Portugal, and Spain, have the best survival rates for cancers. Thank you, Mr. Um, Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers uh, to this point. Uh, 
I too uh, commend Una Crodden and the uh, efforts that she has made to highlight this, this disease from which she, she suffers. But uh, given that we had the debate a year ago nearly coming up in March, and there doesn't seem to have been much progress since then, and also the evidence that shows that only 3% only 3% of women are confident that they can identify a symptom of this disease. Is there not a case that there has to be a standalone campaign on this disease? Well, I can assure the member it isn't as a result of, of anybody uh, dragging their feet on, on, on this issue. Um, courses of work are being carried out, and it is absolutely critical that when we do launch a campaign, we will launch a campaign. That is a campaign that is, um, that is done on the basis of the best knowledge that we have available currently, and that is the work that is being done. Uh, and we will ensure that uh, the messages that are put out are, are messages that, that are strong, that are powerful, and that we can stand over. The UK National Screening Committee states that presently screening shouldn't be offered except in the context of Medical Research Council. Uh, randomized control trial, which is due to report in 2015-16, and that trial is investigating the effectiveness of screening for ovarian cancer using either a blood test or ultrasound screening. And 200,000 women between the ages of 50 and 74 have been recruited to the study. Belfast City Hospital is one of the centres involved in this trial. A sister study, uh, the UK Familial Ovarian Cancer Screening Study, is also ongoing. And the primary objective of that study is to develop a screening strategy for ovarian cancer in terms of most appropriate screening test criteria for interpretation of results and screening interval in women at high risk because of a family history or inherited genetic predisposition. So there is a lot of things that are happening here. The public may not be fully aware of them, but there is a lot of things going on uh, in the fight against ovarian cancer. Joanne Dobson. Mrs. Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I welcome the Minister's commitment to launch the Cancer Awareness Campaign. I'm sure I join other members in this House whose lives have been touched by cancer. Um, I didn't get to know my, one of my grandmothers as she died from ovarian cancer at 41. So, will the Minister commit to further research into the duration and frequency of symptoms before diagnosis, the stage of disease at diagnosis? and subsequent survival? I think I, I probably dealt with a, a lot of that in the, the previous answer in the work that um, we're doing in, with Belfast City Hospital um, as part of a UK-wide uh, research programme uh, into ovarian cancer. Uh, and it's something that we take very seriously. Uh, it uh, is a cancer which uh, is difficult to identify and recognise um, because it can be confused with other symptoms. Uh, of, of things which um, are troublesome, but certainly um, a lot less dangerous than cancer, and consequently not everybody is, is, is identified as quickly as they should be. And uh, therefore, we need to do more work to ensure that people are identified earlier, and therefore have a greater chance of having their lives saved. William Humphrey, Mr. Humphrey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number five. My department's pilot of an end-of-life care strategy for adults in Northern Ireland living matters, dying matters, provides a blueprint for ensuring the best possible palliative and end-of-life care and support are provided for those who are terminally ill and for their families and carers. A significant initiative is currently underway to support the implementation of the recommendations in this strategy and as part of the wider Transforming Your Care reforms. In September 2013, the Health and Social Care Board, in conjunction with the Marie Curie Cancer Care, embarked on a programme of work to transform the delivery of palliative and end-of-life care in Northern Ireland, utilising Marie Curie's nationally developed Delivering Choice programme. My department has also recently undertaken a review of HSC services for children and young people to provide a strategic direction for the future development of services over the next 10 years. Palliative and end-of-life care for children and young people has been considered on its own in order to give prominence to this important area of paediatric services. On January 5, I launched a public consultation on the review of paediatric palliative care. The consultation document sets out 18 recommendations aimed at enhancing the existing high-quality care and support for children and young people with life-limiting or life-threatening conditions and their families. The consultation run, will run until March 
uh, the 20th this year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Can I ask the Minister what results have been found from evaluations of delivering choices, uh, the model which has been taking place uh, in his department? Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, the delivering choice programme has already uh, been delivered in a number of sites across the United Kingdom, helping to pioneer new ways of working that are designed around the individual and their families or carers. And an independent evaluation by the University of Bristol in 2012 of the Delivering Choice programme in Somerset showed that where the programme was in place, there was evidence of reduced emergency admissions, down by 39%, and ANA attendances down by 34% in the last month of life, compared to where the programme was not in place. Alwyn McGuinness. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, central to palliative care is, of course, the uh, pain reducing drugs and uh, control. Uh, I would like the Minister to um, outline his position on the availability of such drugs here in comparison with other areas such as uh, England and Wales. Well, in terms of, uh, I think it was pain relief drugs. Did you indicate? Yeah. In terms of um, pain relief drugs, I, I think that um, the feedback that I get on, on the standard of care at, at end of life is generally one which is very positive. So whether it is organisations such as uh, Marie Curie, um, Northern Ireland Hospice, uh, or indeed many of the other charities that, that provide. Um, support for people, or whether it is our palliative care teams, I, I never hear anything other but huge credit uh, for the very dedicated support that they give, uh, for their knowledge of the issues that they're dealing with, for their sensitivity in care, and for the support that they can quickly enlist uh, from other key clinical providers, such as the doctors and so forth, uh, whenever they need to move things forward. I have had occasional complaints, but certainly compared to many other areas of health, uh, the positive view that people have of the care that is provided vis-à-vis uh, -vis the, the, the complaints that I get uh, massively outweighs that. So uh, I, I have not picked up that there is an issue um, on that particular front. Mervyn Storey. Mr. Storey. Question number six, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my department is currently consulting on its review of paediatric health care services, which aims to build on our existing services for children, which are delivered to a high standard. The review has produced proposals for the future development of hospital and community services and palliative and end-of-life care for children with complex and life-limiting conditions. Their overall aim is to strengthen Northern Ireland's paediatric health care services for the next 10 years. And I'd urge anyone who hasn't already done so to contribute to both consultations, as my department is keen to hear the views of the public on these important services. Mr. Story. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the Minister provide an update on the progress towards the new regional children's hospital? Now, well, my colleague, uh, the Finance Minister, visited the Royal Belfast Hospital uh, for sick children with myself on the 7th of October. And he certainly was quite taken aback by the condition of the hospital in which our children are being treated. So he has uh, indicated that we can have the finance for it, and that a project to replace this outdated facility is now a priority for the executive. And as such, £15.5 million has been allocated by the executive for the scheme in 2014-15. Further associated capital costs <coughs> will be considered by the executive as part of the next budget process. The main aim of the scheme is to ensure that all paediatric services are delivered within a paediatric environment that meets current standards. The capital costs of the project uh, is around £250 million to cover the design and building of the hospital, as well as the site infrastructural works needed to facilitate the running of the new facility. And the outline business case has been reviewed uh, by the DHSS PS officials. It is currently being considered by DFP, and the business case approval could be in place hopefully in the next few weeks, with work commencing in 2014 uh, expected to be completed. Uh, by 2020. Members, that ends the period for all questions to the Minister of Health. We now move to topical questions, and I call William Irwin. Mr. Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Can I ask the Minister how many firework uh, injuries there have been in Northern Ireland in the last year? Well, I have to say that's something that uh, we can view and consider more positively. It's been the best year uh, in terms of fireworks injuries uh, since the data started to be collected back in 1996. So during the 2013 Halloween period, uh, six patients reported to the emergency care department with a firework-related injury. That's eight less than in 2012. Firework injury uh, is collected specifically for the four weeks around Halloween. Now, it's not possible to report on the number of persons going to emergency departments with a firework injury at, at other times of the year. In 2007, a multi-agency firework safety awareness campaign was established, supported by the ministers responsible for the Department of Justice and the Department of Health, Social Service and Public Safety. And the group developed the existing advertising campaign, which has run for the past seven uh, years. The 2013 campaign was very successful, achieving a 75% reduction in the number of firework-related injuries. So we're delighted that that is the case, and many young people who previously uh, in previous years had, had been injured, uh, many will have avoided injury as a result of actually paying attention to the campaign. William. I thank the Minister for response and welcome the fact that there have been less injuries uh, in the last 12 months. Uh, what measures does the Minister think are making a real difference uh, to the, with the public in Northern Ireland? Well, I think the, uh, certainly the campaign has been going on, and, and I thank the press and media. Sometimes I criticise the press and media in this House. In this instance, I would thank the press and media for actually assisting us in getting a, a message out there that fireworks are dangerous and need to be used in the, in the proper context that people are to genuinely enjoy fun with them. So I think that we need to use every um, armory in our, uh, our tool in our armory and certainly getting the message across to the public that safe use of fireworks um, isn't um, teenagers um, basically fooling around with them because they are dangerous that they can be enjoyed, but they need to be enjoyed uh, appropriately. Megan Field. Um, can I ask the Minister to detail how the £30 million allocated in the January monitoring round will be used? Well, thank you, Member, for the question. Well, uh, there is a series of things that we will have to invest in. Um, as I indicated to the House, one of the areas where we identified uh, that we were having uh, particular issues and problems uh, was in children who were identified as, as children at risk. Uh, and I think it will shock many members of the public uh, to learn that uh, we have hundreds more children now identified as children at risk uh, this year than we had last year. And I think that a, lo a lot of that has to do with uh, uh, issues being highlighted um, on television relating to Savile and indeed many other um, personalities mostly associated with the BBC. And uh, that has brought that to people's attention. Uh, so £5 million is, is being spent on that. Uh, there's a number of other areas, including um, urgent care, uh, including uh, uh, elective surgery and so forth, that we will want to continue to support because we have been making a real dent on many of the uh, waiting times that have existed and people are receiving um, care at a much more appropriate time. Uh, so there's a whole series of things that, that we will be spending um, that money on. Uh, whilst we are continue, continuing to attempt to save money within the system, and that is always a challenge to us to ensure that uh, we have as efficient a system as possible, uh, because if we do not deliver efficiencies, uh, then we deny people of services because we are spending money on things that are, are unnecessary um, through inefficiency. I would like to thank the and thank the Minister for his answer. Um, it was said by the Chief Executive of the Health and Social Care Board that a further £28 million would be obtained in transitional funding for transforming your care. And in the June monitoring round, the Department was only able to secure £9.4 million, and a further bid for £7 million was submitted in the January round. So is transforming your care now at risk? It's not at risk. Um, uh, we would like to see it uh, maintaining the momentum that has been developed and the uh, integrated care partnerships, a key aspect of it, uh, are now up and running. Uh, but certainly, uh, we could have done with more, or we, we, we could have used more funding uh, had we received it. Some of that might have been involved in uh, invest to save, which may be for uh, voluntary early redundancy. Uh, but that, uh, if it's not available, will, will, will be not something that we're investing in this year. And uh, maybe that opportunity will not exist for, for individuals to take up 
um, as time moves on. So we will uh, just have to work through with the funding that we have. I, I greatly appreciate the support that the Finance Minister has given me. I should say that there are considerable additional pressures on health this year um, as a consequence of, for example, the Northern Trust has 2,500 additional admissions to hospital. And that's in spite of a whole series of work that have reduced the numbers of people who would need, need to be admitted. They still have 2,500 additional admissions. Um, we have many more older people in our population, many more people with chronic illnesses, and was the case five years ago and was the case ten years ago. That's going to continue to grow, and those pressures are going to continue to build. Sydney Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And continuing on the theme of the monitoring round, uh, Minister, following that recent allocation, can you tell us how this will indeed be of assistance to patients? Thank you. Well, it will certainly help to alleviate um, significant and inescapable pressures that, that have emerged across health and social care. Um, such an allocation will play a critical role in helping to address a range of pressures in frontline services that will affect the most vulnerable in our society, including our looked after children and our elderly population. And as the extent of each of these pressures will be different in each trust, um, the HSCB and the local commissioning groups will be working with those trusts to assess uh, local cost pressures as a basis for allocation. Uh, the, your, the trust that represents your own area, the Southern Trust, uh, would have indicated uh, at the outset of the year that they thought that the financial climate was particularly challenging, um, that they had made a number of efficiencies and, and they were finding it more difficult as a consequence of having, having maybe uh, made more efficiencies at an earlier point than some of the other trusts to actually meet the demands that were, were, were being made of them. So that is a, a, an area of concern. Uh, so we want to ensure that uh, urgent care is, is fully supported, um, that there is uh, no impact upon that. Uh, but we also want to maintain uh, a good standard of elective care uh, happening to ensure that people uh, do receive operations uh, at an appropriate time. Uh, thank you. And can I thank the Minister for that response? But can I further ask uh, the Minister if he expects the year 2014-15 to be uh, as challenging financially? Well, I think it's possibly even, even more challenging. Um, the scale of the, the financial pressures in 2014-15 is uh, very substantial. Uh, my department is currently engaging with the HSCB and Trust to fully understand the nature of those challenges, to identify potential savings and measures and efficiency opportunities in order to address them. However, whilst significant saving opportunities have already been identified, our initial planning work still suggests a significant and as yet unresolved financial pressure in that year, and the Executive's full engagement will therefore be required in order to ensure that health and social care services for patients and clients in Northern Ireland do not suffer as a result. Paul Gibbon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the Minister will be aware that the Government at Westminster are bringing forward an amendment to the Children and Families Bill that will outlaw the sale of e-cigarettes to under 18-year-olds. What action will the uh, Northern Ireland Executive, led by him and the Department of Health, take to deal with this? Yes, I certainly am taking note of what, what is happening in England. The things seem to be moving very, very rapidly, and uh, therefore I think that uh, we will need to be looking at how we can uh, quickly assess the situation and uh, carry out some movement on it. Uh, I was speaking to my teenage daughter the other day, and, and, and she was telling me that. Uh, Lots of children in, in, in her school are, are, are using e-cigarettes, e and that's, that's something which I would, uh, would be most unhappy with. Uh, I know that e-cigarettes are being used by smokers as an alternative, and it probably is a better alternative than smoking. But I don't think that it is any alternative to get youngsters under the age of 18 hooked on nicotine. And I think it's very, very important that we make a full assessment of this and it will respond quickly to it, and uh, I will be looking very closely at what Westminster is doing and seeing how we in Northern Ireland could move this uh, forward uh, with uh, the appropriate knowledge on the subject to do so. Paul Gibbon. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank the Minister for that response. But given that e-cigarettes contain uh, dangerous toxins, the amount of nicotine, other chemicals and contaminants varies across products. 
How concerned is he that the, these e-cigarettes, whilst some will say is there to reduce people engaged in uh, smoking tobacco, is actually now being seen as a trendy uh, thing to be doing, particularly for young people, and therefore we need to be taking urgent action here in Northern Ireland, the way in which it is being taken in the United Kingdom? Yeah, uh, again, as in the case of my older daughter, who is at university now, and, and she was telling me about the sort of numbers that we're smoking. Obviously, these are bright, intelligent young people um, doing, doing their third level education. Uh, and they're smoking cigarettes, which uh, will kill uh, at least half of them as a result of purely uh, smoking. And you have, ask a question well, well, how did it happen? Well, because it was seen to be cool, it was seen to be hip, it was seen to be trendy. A lot of the cool people in films and, and so forth smoke uh, and on, on our, our TV screens. And the tobacco industry has been very, very good at making smoking appear cool. I have no doubt that people selling e-cigarettes will have no problem in making it appear to be a cool thing to do. And nicotine is a more addictive substance than heroin. And we really need to be challenging uh, the, the use of nicotine in such a way. And we need to be discouraging people, um, and particularly our young people, uh, because two-thirds of smokers start smoking whenever uh, they're under 18. So we really need to be ensuring that we're getting the right messages out and we're taking the right actions to ensure that young people don't start smoking in the first place and that they don't believe that it is something cool, hip or trendy to be engaged in. Mr. Boyle. I can could I ask the Minister to uh, detail the cooperation between Dublin and Belfast in relation to children's heart services? Well, a course of work has, has commenced there, and, and we recently appointed the, the final uh, person for the team, uh, uh, someone of eminence from, from, from uh, Glasgow, uh, who will assist us in developing uh, what is possible to do in terms of paediatric and general cardiac services here in Belfast um, in association. Uh, with uh, the services at Our Ladies Hospital in Dublin. And uh, that is something that I have committed to from an early point. Whenever the first proposal came out that we should stop services in Northern Ireland and use services that were available in England, I, I opposed that. And I think that was the right thing to do and have always been opposed to that idea. However, a number of children from Northern Ireland will always have to travel to England because of the high uh, complexity that's involved. And indeed, a number of children from the Republic of Ireland will also have to travel to England um, to have that more complex surgery. Uh, so we are, are delighted to have um, the team set up and in place now to look at that course of work. Well, I'm going to thank the Minister for his answer, but Minister, would you like to comment in relation to the recent incident where the uh, air ambulance had to make an emergency landing in Liverpool? Surely that's something we should be looking at trying to eradicate, given, given the fact of what happened and what the family had said in relation to that actual service. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it was for that very reason that um, I opposed the notion that we should be reliant on uh, having our services uh, provided by England uh, for paediatric congenital services. And we have a big issue in terms of attracting uh, the, the appropriate skill base. Uh, because we have a smaller number of surgical procedures taking place. And that is why I have committed to, to working with Dublin, because it's in the best interest of children that we do so. Uh, and I think that's very, very important. Um, we could have had circumstances in Northern Ireland where there was heavy fog, for example, and where flights couldn't take off at all and, and emergency surgery w was required. And therefore, having um, a facility which is um, on the same landmass uh, to use uh, is something that, that uh, we would desire. My first preference is to ensure that we continue to maintain uh, and support services uh, at the Royal Belfast Hospital for sick children in conjunction uh, with services in Dublin. I need their support to deliver that, and I hope that the team will identify uh, a, 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 a course of work that will show that that can be done in a safe way. Uh, the name of the professor had slipped my mind. It's Dr. Sinclair uh, from Glasgow. Uh, he'll be joining our team, um, led by Professor Meyer.
Time is up. That includes question time.